Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you uh, to the uh, second breakfast in our Good Governance Conversation series. And it is a great privilege uh, to have you all here. First of all, also thank you to our rector, Professor Russell Botman, who will be delivering the speech today. After the speech, there will also be an interactive discussion. Uh, this is a conversation series, and therefore we take uh, inputs from thought leaders, but we also would like to have a lot of input from you, which also links up, uh, um, which I have to say at the start, the rector uh, has a management meeting of the University of Stellenbosch starting at 9, meaning that he must unfortunately leave at about 8.30. Um, and if he doesn't uh, mind, we will probably continue with the discussion. Um, I know that he doesn't want to know everything that happens in this university. <laughs> it's probably better. It's a better university for that. Um, from our side, uh, I would just like to uh, say that, um, first of all, uh, I'm very pleased and happy that you are here. I'm quite sure, and I experience the same feeling, that when you wake up this morning, and you thought, well, I have no particular responsibility in this meeting. Should I just not stay in bed on probably one of the most coldest winter mornings in the cave in this season? And you all had the courage and the conviction to get up and go. So I think that's great, and we really appreciate it. Um, and we will have the next one in, in spring, which will make it easier to get up and, um, and to be here. But thank you very much for, for taking the effort, and I think it will be well worth your while. Um, uh, we are welcoming all of you. Uh, we are welcoming our rector. We also have a, a, a number of, of local government representatives here. Um, and we welcome uh, the, some of the aldermen and councillors who are here. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, we also would like to, at this point, just state the purpose of this series. It's a series of, of lectures, as I say, and discussions in a good governance conversation, specifically looking at the constitution related to service delivery and leadership, implementation and leadership. We have just established um, on this campus a cross-cutting initiative, a cross-cutting initiative between the School of Public Leadership, my school, the University of Stellenbosch Business School, University of Stellenbosch uh, business School Education Company, as well as the Institute for Futures Research, and that cross-cutting initiative is called the Stellenbosch Good Governance Forum. The Stellenbosch Good Governance Forum, the SGGF. And can I tell you, you know the story that academic battles are so fierce because the stakes are so low. Um, now, this was not an easy thing to establish, but we are working on it now. And we will be doing more of these things on this campus in order to enhance the conversation, involve the constitution, and deal with good governance from a Stellenbosch perspective. Um, uh, it is fascinating what the possibilities are in this regard. This being very close to Youth Day, we thought that it is appropriate to look today at the, um, uh, at the youth and leadership and the role of universities because we are an excellent university and we're very proud of Stellenbosch as a university and what should we be doing in leadership development but specifically related to the youth. So that, that's the reason for the discussion today and we will be uh, introduced to the topic by the rector. Let me conclude by just uh, giving our sincere appreciation to all of our partners on the campus also to the partners who are involved in this and be looking at enhancing the partnership and for today's purposes um, a continued partner in this breakfast session is the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, represented here by uh, Advocate Johan Krier. Uh, we have the Konrad Arnau Stiftung here, uh, our colleague over there um, who is, is sitting there and they are the sponsoring partners. And by the way, being a German sponsoring partner, you have to please sign the register, otherwise they don't pay for the, for the breakfast. Uh, their, their systems of accountability are quite serious. Um, so uh, that's, that, that's very much appreciated uh, to the current Anjaar Stiftung. Then for purposes of today, but also for the future, we believe in cross-cutting partnerships and affiliations. We're very happy and very proud 
to be associated with the Friedrich von Sales Slavic Institute for, for Leadership as well. We will continue this conversation, but also have joint projects. We are looking forward to that. And then I, I, I cannot but thank my, my team of young interns. The president said in his State of the Nation address, we should have youth employment and have interns. I have many. I'm going to have more. And there they are, all at that table, brilliant young people. A part of the privilege that I have in life is to be associated and be able to work with brilliant young people. I'm not going to name them all, but uh, Natalie is coming from there, there's Marlene, there is Christine, and uh, they are helping us this morning. And it's great to be associated with brilliant young people. Wade will also have an opportunity to show his brilliance off today at some stage. Wade, now I have to just on the spot, eh? <laughs> okay. Okay, let me then introduce to you our eminent speaker, uh, Professor Raymond Russell Bortman. Now, Professor Bortman is now in the second term as director of physics and science at the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, he dient as director of higher education in Africa. He is the senior physics president for the Vereniging of Africa University and Raad Voorzitter van Kaapstad as Wereld Ontwerp Hoofstad. Um, earlier this year, Professor Bartman received an honorary doctorate from Hope College in Michigan in the US in recognition of his leadership in higher education to promote a more just society for all South Africans. And you will also know that he is the thought leader and intellectual um, um, leader of, of our Stellenbosch Hope Project, which has given us many opportunities to, to, do, to make the world a better place. Last year, he received the Abraham Kuyper Prize for Excellence in Theology and Public Life from Princeton Theological Seminary. He has also received honorary membership of the United Nations Association of South Africa for advancing the Millennium Development Goals. Professor Bartman, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Aaron, and uh, uh, the director for my own uh, interviews for you. And I hope we'll uh, have a good time to meet the Abraham with the car and respect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming up so early. As Aaron says, it, uh, uh, to, to do something like this in the middle of the Cape winter. Thanks, dedication, and uh, I'm sure you didn't come for a nice breakfast. Now, I want to tell you two stories. Uh, since we're here to discuss a very interesting topic that all of universities in cultivating leadership, and the way I want to tackle it is by telling a story about two universities, about their impact on two sets of leadership. And I hope they will let, yeah, that uh, these stories will practically illustrate you what we should be talking about at this time of our history. For the first one, let's go back to 1976. In fact, quite appropriately, so close to, to Youth Day, back to June 16, of that year. I was a student at the time at UWC, a member of the Student Representative Council. We were politically aware somehow, but the events of that winter's morning in Soweto still caught us by surprise. The shock waves of children taking on the bite of the apartheid state and paying for it with their lives quickly spread throughout the country and the world. Men's perceived as Khrumet Fult, as the only and the rectors of Kinders to the mark for an idea. And for the idea of an apartheid, the army saw. At the University of the Western Cape, we had to struggle with the question, how should we respond to this? 
we had long and difficult debates. At one point, uh, Jake Scavell uh, suggested to us that we take the whole week out and spend it in a symposium. And we did so. And we had people speaking to us every day, throughout the day, into the night. And we had these discussions as you would have your breakfast discussions about what is it that impacts us so that we should respond. Now we had all kinds of thoughts from let us, we must do something because we must stand in solidarity with the people of Soweto. And on the other end, to the other extent, no, it is not about the people of Soweto. The students got up for their own rights and what we must ask ourselves is why should we stand up as well. But we are later and I know further the crystal is here to infant on theology to center and was to a theologist student, Professor Jaap Durant, was a good target on the Wilke Vraag the Vraag. They say, Amal say that it's for care with apartheid. But what do you want the theolog to do as for care with apartheid? En hy uh, het gesê, dit is so dat dit leid tot onrecht, dit is so dat gesinne opgebreek raak, daar is maatschappelijke probleme wat ontstaan, dit is so dat mense verarm word, maar dit is die theologische vraagstukke nie. Wat is die theologische probleem? En hy het ons gedrukt, hy het ons boeken laat lees, waarvan die dikte ek nie eers vir die kant verduidelik nie. En dier daar die hele proces het ontstaan die idee, die inzicht, dat iemand wat in apartheid glo, moet glo dat mense onversoenbaar is met mekaar. Dis die persoon sy uitgangspunt in die lewe is dit. En as jy dit het, dan kan die persoon nie ook nog een christen wees nie. Want in die, in die christendom is versoening die hart van die evangelie. So we started thinking about it, what could it mean if we begin to translate this thing that we understand now theologically into political action, into political leadership, into an engagement with society. And it led to very important debates. But if we actually think that apartheid takes its point of departure in the irreconcilability of people, what did it mean, what would it mean to take your point of departure in the reconcilability of people? What did it mean if you just believe the opposite than what they say is the idea? And out of that, we developed a sense of leadership, a sense of committing to people who are living in poverty, a sense of standing up to the might sometimes of the military of this country, a sense of seeking not only the transformation of our own thoughts, at the transformation of our own university through those very important events. And the result is that UWC will never be the same again. Out of an apartheid Bush College emerged a university with leading students <coughs> and staff that would have a lasting impact not only on the Western Cape but on many parts of the world. Everybody in to Geneva knows that the understanding of the theological justification of apartheid was developed at the University of the Western Cape by students with one professor and a lot of books. Now, instead of remaining closed Universities should become sites of struggle for thought leaders. Sites of struggle in the sense that you don't have to fight probably against the military might of the government, but you have to fight against the way people think when they think in the wrong direction, when their thoughts push us back to irreconcilability and to injustice. So it is the idea of building 
the understanding of free communities that are open, characterized by freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of association. And universities are the places where these debates must take place, where the diversity of these debates should help us go forward. That is, I always say this is, this is the big mistake, and perhaps one could say stupidity, of those who led the apartheid government, is that they thought if you bring the brightest colored people together in one university, nothing will happen. And they made a big mistake. And then they thought, let's take the brightest blacks to another university, and nothing will happen. And they made a big mistake. The thing is, is where, where the people come together with the diversity of thoughts from a whole country, from KwaZulu Natal to the Western Cape, throughout the country, they bring together the best intellectual, incisive thinking and critical thought that leads countries throughout the world, that builds this world, but also that help us become receive it's not live. Become the better world that we should be. So to enable students to have the crucial experiences that will prepare them for a leadership role in society, that is the most important thing that we can do. It's just teach them a few things and expose them to the best thinkers of their time. Now there's also a second story. Lusaka, 1989. The year is 1989, and we're still here in the Western Cape, but at a different university, Stellenbosch University. The country is still in turmoil, and youth are engaging with issues around them. The apartheid government still has an iron grip on the country, and the liberation movements are still banned but progressive students decide they want to find out for themselves what is going on. So 18 student leaders from Stellenbosch decide to travel to Lusaka to meet with the ANC at its headquarters in exile. And unbeknown to them, all hell breaks loose here in the country. The students are threatened with expulsion they are harassed by the security police. They are made out to be traitors. And all they wanted to pursue was free thinking, clear understanding, and peaceful dialogue. Now, why this controversy? Are student leaders supposed to take on an active interest in society? And have there not been many other safaris before that to Lusaka, to Dakar? to Arare for talks with the ANC. So why the fuss about this visit? I think there are only two reasons. These were young people. And secondly, from Stellenbosch University. And as much as they represented a university that had been pivotal to the idea of Afrikaner nationalism from the beginning, so if young critical voices at Stellenbosch were growing louder, it would become harder to keep everyone else on song. This past weekend we had a reunion in Stellenbosch of the Mahdists who went to Lusaka 25 years ago. And I told them we owe them a debt of gratitude. Not because they spoke to the ANC per se, but because they were prepared to do their bit to help fix what was so apt obviously wrong with South Africa at the time. They took the lead in doing the right thing, despite the cost to themselves. They were young, but they showed Martis the way towards the future. Five years later, a political settlement had been reached in South Africa, and the country held its first democratic elections. These are two very pivotal stories about universities, young people, willingness to engage with the other and with a totally different viewpoint and then the willingness to begin out of that in engagement to ask yourself what is it that you can do to lead the country 
into justice, into reconciliation, into peace. And the impact on, of their actions on their alma mater was certainly quite significant. If 1976 was a turning point for the country and for the University of the Western Cape, 1989 was a turning point for Martis. Stella Bosch should never be the same after the students had their trip to Osaka. Today, Stella Bosch is no longer a university only serving a section of the population. We are now a national asset. A place of diversity, Nimir, Folks Volksburg, Sydney, Mar, you will sit from the best denkers and the latest from the Tukums. And this is the end of the United States, the Copscape Health Market. Now, I must tell you something about what we're doing around this idea of thought leadership. Austria now stands there now on a plaque to be as far as the end layers for the Tukums of Kaput Kanbor. And Stan Bosch University's new vision 2030. We have set ourselves the goal of becoming a place where thought leaders are educated for the future. And we are doing this by becoming more inclusive, more innovative, and future focused. We want our students to examine life critically and to be active and engaged citizens. The country certainly needs thought leaders for the future. 20 years into our democracy, a lot has been achieved in our country, but many challenges remain, both old and new. And the way to make a difference is to cultivate thought leadership for their future. An important vehicle that we are using for this purpose is the Institute for Student Leadership Development. It is named after Dr. Friedrich Kratzeus Slavert, a former student, lecturer, and eventually chancellor of Stellenbosch. He had, devoted, he had devoted his life to building democracy and non-racialism in South Africa. It is no longer enough for universities to just provide graduates with good academic qualifications. We are working to develop well-rounded thought leaders who are committed to plowing back into society, who will build this country and make it the kind of place that it should be. <laughs> By acting responsibly as a leader in the interest of society, young people can give real substance to the idea <coughs> that what Africa has to offer to the world is Ubuntu, the notion that a person is a person through other persons, even in their minds. I want to tell you one last story looking into the future. It is about the girl child. You will all know that in the Millennium Development Goals, one of the very important goals is the question of how do we empower the girl child, especially in developing countries, especially on our continent. There's a, the, we have done a lot in the Millennium Development Goals across this time to get the girl child first into primary school. And it was a very important thing. There are very many people who missed it at that point. And secondly, get that girl child into high school. And now the girl child is entering university. And the big challenge is whether universities are ready to be challenged by the girl child, their way of thinking, their way of challenging the reality, their way of looking at the future, their way of engaging other people. It is clear to me that the girl child will be the leaders of the future. That they will be the change makers of, a, of the moral system that we have inherited in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And I, I don't have to tell you the big story about that moral system, but they will change that moral system. They will no longer be the people who simply 
bring children into the world so that somebody can go to work somewhere so that somebody can survive at home. They will be the people who say, let us talk about our moral system, the way we do our values, the way we go forward together. And it's going to be one of the most difficult but most interesting debates awaiting the world. They will also be the transformers of the economy. They will begin to have an impact, not only on politics, people see that and they think that the girl child, the women will make a very important impact on, on the way we do politics, but they will transform the economy to a very real extent and it will begin to look at human beings in a totally different way. Now, if you don't believe me, Boko Haram has seen this future. They have seen the real leaders of this future. They've looked at the women and they, like many traditionalists everywhere, from whatever religion they are, are scared. Because they know what it will do. It will destroy patriarchy and its values. It will build a new sense of human dignity and those values. And it will lead us into a new world where a new diversity of engagement will take place that we have not really seen as yet. And they will now do traditionalist, especially extreme traditionalists will start it and other traditionalists will join them. They will attack learners and they will attack education because they see that vehicle of the leaders, of the leadership of the girl child, going through their cities, going through their towns, going through their farms, moving across this continent and leaving a stamp, a footprint of a totally new society that they don't like. And we will have to learn to open up those spaces here in South Africa. And we have to open up those spaces as we see all the difficulties happening in poorer communities. And we must remember that the girl child will go through a more difficult time in the next years, especially in poor communities, simply because people can begin to see a difference in their future and they don't like it. Thank you. Goed, ons gaan uh, die proces voor sit baie dankie, professor Botman, vir baie inzichtgevende uh, begin van die, van die denkproces, en ons gaan die ondersteun, ons gaan die universiteit positioneer, om na hierdie faktore allemaal te kyk, um, en ek kan sê, my bijdraas is dat, uh, al my interns by die stadium met die uitsovering van Inos Lekalo, is girl child, so, <laughs> ons doen ons deel. Um, ek gaan nou oorhande gaan, Dr. Leslie van Rooij, wat die rest van die facilitering sal doen, Dr. van Rooij is, uh, hierdie ding het nou weet van een fluit, um, ek weet nie hoe kom nie, maar hoe dit ook al sê, uh, hy is die directeur van die Frederik van Seil Slabber, uh, Stig, um, instituut, excuse op instituut, en uh, hy werk dus elke dag met uh, jong studenten, leiders, en maak een besondere bijdrage voor die, voor die ontwikkeling van leiderskap binnen die universiteit, en teenwoordig dus een baie netische complementariteit, en dit wat die rektor reeds gesê het binnen die universiteit van Stelbos en ook vir die land. Daar is een hele aantal uitstekende en uitnemende projecte by die instituut, waar voor ons groot waardering het vir die leiding wat Leslie en sy span daar neem, en ek weet sy, sy manier van werk is genootskapelijk, en gebaseer op goeie verhoudings, en op dienstleiderskap, en denkleiderskap, een combinatie van dienstleiderskap en denkleiderskap. So Leslie, baie dankie dat, dat jy hier is, en dat jy nou die rest van die, van die facilitering gaan waarneem. Uh, ek gee graag aan Leslie van Rooij.
Baie dankie, Erwin. Dit is baie lekker om hier te wees. Jy is helemaal recht. Um, dit is vir ons een groot voorrecht om saam te werk. Uh, Johan, ook met jylle, en ek sien uit na goeie pad saam. Uh, thank you, Professor Bortman. I think uh, you not only open the conversation on the right note, uh, but I look forward to the comments a little bit later. Uh, and Wade will start the comment process. Uh, Wade, I'll invite you to the floor. Now, Wade Group is currently an SRC member at Stellenbosch University uh, and also a fellow uh, of the Alan Gray Orvis Foundation. So, a very prominently involved uh, student, both at Stellenbosch University uh, and externally. And we're very fortunate to have Wade as a coordinator uh, for one of our courses at the Leadership Institute. Now, everyone, I'm absolutely convinced that there's no better way to describe Wade as he did on Saturday during the Lusaka reunion as a lefty. And I think in that sense, uh, it is up for you to comment uh, on what our rector has said. And we welcome you to the floor and look forward to hear uh, how you will guide us in this conversation. Thank you, Wade. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I have quite a few notes that I made in terms of what Professor Bortman had said, but then I also prepared some of my own thoughts on thought leadership and where Stellenbosch University can be and where it's going and what the university is doing successfully. Um, I have the privilege to be at the event on Saturday and meet the Lusaka um, group, and I was quite happy because I think it's one of those stories that we don't know about at Stellenbosch. We um, aparte, um, in fact, Stellenbosch University is, what is often seen as this birthplace of aparte, but we don't hear much about the progressive voice that stemmed um, from Stellenbosch in the late 80s. Um, I'm going to start with what Professor Bosman ended off his speech with, and this is um, one of my concerns, moreover, is this idea of the girl child, and some of my concerns with the type of language we use in the South African reality 20 years into a democracy. Now obviously, being a young South African male, it might seem that I'm anti the empowerment of women, and by all means, no. I think the empowerment of the girl child is fundamentally important, but at the moment, and we see it often, especially in the colored community, that there is a large absence of male role models. It is often females who lead the household. And I think what we as South Africans need to do and more overly um, in universities is that we need to also start looking at the investment into the boy child. Because as much as we're creating well-groomed, phenomenal super women, we need to create super men that are able to work independently to find solutions for South Africa's complexities. So the idea of thought leadership, I think first is, what's the role of universities in general in terms of developing leaders? I think primarily it's a societal responsibility. Universities are there to train skilled individuals that help come up with solutions for society's problems. Interesting, I looked up, oh, I tried to look up some definitions on thought leadership and it came up very often that the idea of being a thought leader is not something you bestow upon yourself. It's normally bestowed upon you by another based on what you know. So people will speak about thought leaders in innovation, but it's based on their contributions in the, in the sector of innovation. So another thing about thought leaders is that they are bold and brave, and I think that's evident in both the group in 1976 and 1989, was that they were bold and brave and they were willing to challenge their own way of thinking and the thinking of others. They were also able to move from this idea of just idea generation, but also to implementation. But what is Stellenbosch doing? Stellenbosch has developed the Freddy van Selslaw Leadership Institute um, as one of those key spaces where student leaders are developed. I think what the institute does well is that it afford students the opportunity to expand not only the understanding of different contexts outside their rigorous academic program, but it also exposes them to different realities within South Africa. Now, there's a slight problem with this, because I don't think that the out-of-classroom experience is the only space where our leaders must be developed. 
I think we need to start looking at why the academic programs are so rigorous and why the academic space is not utilized effectively to develop leaders or thought leaders moreover. I think one of my major problems is that it is because the academic programs are so rigorous that people are unable to comprehend different realities. And this is partly, I suppose, a higher education problem in South Africa. Because what we are trying to do is churn out these skill-based graduates that will become the doctors or the lawyers or the this or the that, that will change society. And not necessarily people that think about how they will utilize what they have studied to impact the development of South Africa and the globe. I think it's important for us to understand the complex realities of South Africa, the socioeconomic divide, and the need for an inclusive um, and open university or open university system for all. In 2013 and 2014, we have seen the sort of student activism from students that come from various academic backgrounds. But these students are students that have been developed primarily, I would say, at the Leadership Institute. So where I see universities moving forward, and especially towards 2030, is that the academic programs start looking at how they can use that space, that in-class in space, to develop leaders who are not necessarily able to tap into the institute for some other reason, who are not able to tap into a leadership structure on campus. I think um, it's important for us to also then realize that there is, however, skill shortage. It is clear that academic staff do not have the skills to facilitate the type of leadership development programs that we need. We need to train not only students to become the thought leaders of tomorrow, but we also need to understand that the facilitators of these processes are ill-equipped to really facilitate the type of thinking or the type of um, development we want in the country. So essentially, the university is doing a wonderful job with the institute, but I think we need to start asking some of the tougher questions of how the academic space can be utilized more effectively to develop leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Wade. Uh, an immediate challenge on the table. Uh, Evan, you'll join uh, the panel conversation. I would love uh, Professor Botman and yourself uh, to say one or two things about the in-class, out-of-class. The next part uh, of this morning conversation will be open to the audience. And in just uh, a little while, I'll ask you uh, to um, ask questions. We have a roaming mic. Natalie uh, almost wrote uh, it. We'll have a mic. It would be great if we can ask uh, questions linked to the themes as discussed uh, by Prof. Botman and by Wade and in Evan's opening remarks. Uh, there are a number of them, uh, Wade, shall I call them colleagues, students who participated in some of our programs here, so I hope they will also challenge Wade. I'll start off the conversation uh, by um, adding, well, not adding, but asking a question to the panelists, and it would be great. Everyone, if you can join us in this question, just give us an idea about these this um, out of class and in class type of experience. And if in our classrooms, also in the School for Public Leadership, we see the development and exposure of, of young people or growing thought leaders to the experts and the, the style of thought leaders, as Professor Botman uh, noted earlier, can we see that? Is it happening? Uh, and if not, how can we make it better? Okay, uh, let, let me just respond to that particular question. I think universities should be developing leadership, as it were, intrinsically and integrally throughout all of its programs. So in a class in physics, you are obviously developing leadership in physics, but over and above developing leadership in physics, you must also teach people the values related to physics because you can use physics to generate, generate electricity with some possibly unintended consequences, but you can also use physics to build nuclear bombs. So everything that you do is not value neutral, and therefore each discipline has to involve some form of moral and functional leadership, as it were, thinking within their teaching. But that takes a very special type of, of teacher. Um, and that means that the teachers, the, the docent, should be developed in those directions. 
Our remit in the School of Public Leadership is to teach public leadership. But obviously we also te teach a lot of gover government officials and in that process we teach things such as finances and we teach such things, things as human resources and of course those all have leadership implications. So for us it is in some ways closer to our core business but I don't think it means that physics teachers shouldn't be teaching leadership or for that matter medical um, teachers shouldn't be teaching leadership. So it's got to be integrated and integral. Having said that, there's also opportunity and need for special programs such as the Van Sales Slaber Institute and I think it's a combination of those things. Yeah. Yes, I, I think um, one of the big challenges that we will face at Stellenbosch University and we'll tackle much of that next year is the renewal of our curriculum. Uh, we have to go ask the, the real and difficult questions about whether we teach subjects or whether we teach people. And if we're teaching people, then we must teach them for a full-rounded life, for a full-rounded life in, in society. And the question is, the uh, question would be, are we helping them to think critically about the right questions? Are we helping them to, to build an ethical approach to life? Um, and uh, it, is, um, it, it is going to be a difficult thing because what, what uh, we as, uh, as academics don't like is to relook the things that worked in the past even if they did not work. And the whole thing is it's how do we do that and how do we secure that we do it with a, with a view on the kind of society that we are building. And it is, uh, it is, it is difficult because uh, it will mean that some of us will have to face the issue of interdisciplinary work We'll have to ask the question, who else should be actually in my, be in my class and teach with me and facilitate this discussion? And uh, one of the big change makers of education in the world is, a uh, change maker is, is, is the question of technology. It's going to change the way we do things. And I'd like to see uh, how that will help actually upgrade the quality. Of, uh, of our teaching and learning. But yes, we have to think of people as, uh, as human beings, but at Stellenbosch University in a very special way. Think of every person in front of us as a person that will lead the society. And, uh, and every moment missed in preparing them for that will lead to a society that will decry their leadership one day. And we will remember that we actually had the opportunity to, to make that person the best kind of leader in private sector, in the public sector, sphere field as you are working on, uh, Erwin, but also uh, generally in, in society, uh, as we will continue to try and help do that with the institute as well. Great. Remark? I think for me, um, what Stellenbosch really needs to do is look at, especially with having a vision 2030, Stellenbosch University must re-look really what the Stellenbosch graduate will look like. Because not everyone's going to go into postgraduate studies, not everyone has that opportunity. So once someone leaves with an undergrad degree, what does that Stellenbosch Marty or that Marty look like? And the only way we can look at it is when we look at it holistically by really reassessing how the academic curriculum is structured and whether we are able to make an whether we're going to churn out Marty's or in fact understanding of inclusivity, transformation, have a future focus, and the classroom experience is one of the spaces that really needs to champion this as well. Thank you. I'll come back to the 1976 and Lusaka uh, conversation a little bit later, but I'm going to open it up for some questions or remarks. Everyone has indicated that this is a conversation, so uh, we will all join in uh, collaboration and, and answering and, and thinking with, but I've seen one hand over here uh, uh, for the first question and one hand for the next take two, uh, and here it is comments or remarks and questions and take it from there. Thank you.
Thanks. Let me stand somewhere where I don't have to break too many people's necks. I have no connection with the uh, University of Stellenbosch. I'm here because I got an invite somehow or other. But I do want to add, I'm uh, sorry, I'm Paul Hoffman from the Institute for Accountability. I just want to add an anecdote that probably everybody who has already spoken can use. This system of interns behind me uh, participated in swimming upstream in the uh, battle against the culture of impunity, which is abroad in the land at the moment, and which could break us completely if we don't pay proper leadership attention to uh, the questions of corruption. And how did they do that? They participated <laughs> in a public challenge that was put out through the Institute for Accountability, calling on young people to, to come up with a plan, legislation, a policy to fight corruption. And the team from Stellenbosch won that competition and one of the team, also a girl child, joined the legal team that then continued when the suggestions were ignored by those in power. And the case is back in court again, in the Constitutional Court this time, on the 18th of August. So you are doing something right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. I'm very proud of my team who won that. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't boast about them, that's why I did it for them. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a hand right at the back. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Bradley, I'm from the So that full cycle that he was talking about and the challenges that we had in the past and the challenges we are facing in the future. And it's, it's, it's very clear when we listen to each other speaking and when we look at the media, what is being propagated in the media, that we still have not reconciled. Some of us can speak about the hardships and we really experience those hardships. Uh, and I'm particularly uh, referring to the latter speaker now, where we tend to look at what is currently happening only in particular spheres, and we forget that what we're talking about here is developing the young people to be good, efficient, let's say call it non-corrupt leaders in the future. And so the university does have an obligation. And I look at the medical school, um, Within our curriculum, and I'm, I'm fortunate to have two of my uh, student interns here with me. My daughter was also in medical school, a theology student, and my wife was also affiliated to the university. And if I look at the uh, medical uh, curriculum, we do not have enough of this. We do not train our doctors to go out there and really be leaders. And they do not even know how to do that, to be leaders within their field and outside the fields as to lead the community that they are serving. So my plea is that there should be uh, really input from uh, the director side and the university side to look at every field of study and see how we can impact in developing our youth to this new futuristic thing. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to take one more question comment and then I'll hand over to the panel. I think Professor Botman, you'll have to leave <coughs> after the sound. My name is André de Plessis. I can see my far too long. I listen to the challenges we are debating here with education, 
corruption, reconciliation, and so forth. And we're looking at how to develop the boy child and the girl child to become proper patriarchs and matriarchs one day, side by side, not the one in front of the other. And the question I pose is, one looks at this, this cycle repeats itself over and over through the centuries. Isn't it time that we put the mother back in the home, not in the house, in the kitchen, we go back in the home as the educator, the doctor, the nurturer, the psychologist, and put the boy child where he belongs to develop as the patriarch one day, to lead, to protect, and provide. And when you people receive these boy child and girl child at university, they are already nurtured and educated and prepared for life. Because as you try and educate them at university, it's too late. We can't afford to receive them already broken. Let's fix things, and that's at the level of the home. And the mothers play such critical roles there. That's the question I pose here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a question on patriarchy and matriarchy, remarks on what the Bush University is doing, and a very relevant point about the curriculum and uh, students and graduates impacting society. Let's get some remarks. Professor Bodman, we will start with you. Thank you. I have uh, learned one thing, and that is that you must ask yourself the question, why do you think like that when you think in a certain way? And one of the one of the big changes that people who look into the future can see is that women spend more time in education than ever before. They go and they don't walk out of the university unless they're around at least 17 and they say that it will grow to 22, 25 over the next years. And they then go into their workplace and they decide not to get married very soon. And it's, it is just part of the developments of our time and in the demography of our world. Then you must ask yourself, what do you, what are the things that must be done in the society that is changing so quickly around this very important reality and a very important part that we for a long time thought that, that they, are, they are the nurturers of children and they are now seeing themselves as people who will nurture children, but much later in their lives, they will build their careers, and they will play a role in society. And it is, it is very difficult to see how, how you can just put them back into the home. The, the reality is that it is their choice. It is not anymore the choice of anybody that they should live in that way. And the, the big challenge that people have is that we all realize that it brings a, a sense of lack of stability in the family because actually we use women to create that stability. And that was their job. You see that this place is stable and I don't want any trouble here. But now the reality is that if that is changing, then we have to find new ways and new values to stabilize our societies, stabilize our families, etc. And it is not easily done as we did in the past. And we'll have to find a way to do it in such a way that you engage women to become part of this conversation. Because they're not going to be told what to do. They're going to be asked. And in asking them, you'll get the answer. 
And the answer you may not like, but that is going to be the answer to deal with. And I think the male, males will have to prepare themselves for a very difficult and important conversation about many things that I see it already among many of my friends who work very hard on the question of family values because they feel that this is the thing that they are losing. But it's, uh, Boko Haram also feels that education is taking other things away from them. And the thing is we'll have to have a conversation about that. And we have the conversation with women and among ourselves listening to women as well. And it is it is something that we'd better start sooner than later. OK, I, uh, I would like to link up to the other aspects, the curriculum aspects. I think we should also not be, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Professor Bodman, thank you very much. And uh, we accept that uh, you have to get to that important meeting and appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. I must go to my curriculum now. Uh, <laughs> and I just, while he's walking out, he can listen to this. We should not paint the university in an isolated corner. The university is part of a society. And when we talk about leadership development, the leadership development should not only be in the classroom and related to the curriculum. We should actually engage in, as a university very actively with society. And that is part of the things that we are doing within the School of Public Leadership and also in our newly established Stalemos Good Governance Forum. We are creating opportunities to engage with society. We are creating forums such as these. We are creating one of our projects which we are running um, in the next couple of months is what we call the Leadership in Dava. The Leadership in Dava, for example, uh, engages with mid-career, late-career, and contemplating new career professionals. And some of my Leadership in Dava enrollees are here in the audience. What we are going to do is we are going to problematize certain societal issues in the Leadership in Dava deal with it as senior leaders and come up with leadership learning. So there's an approach which says it's not only about what you do in leadership development, it's not only about what you do, it's also about how you do it and where you do it. And I think we shouldn't isolate ourselves into, as it were, the hallowed halls of the university. We should engage with society. That's why my interns engage with competitions. That's why my professional colleagues engage with leadership in the leadership in Dava. That's why we're creating on this campus the school, the Center for, for Good Governance, or the, the Star Wars Good Governance Forum. And a thing which we are developing here, which is we call a collaboratory. We should be creating projects in society and then learn from those projects by means of action learning. So that, that action learning learns from action and action informs learning. And that is our vision. We will not stay within the walls of this university. If we want to make a significant impact, it's out there, it's not in here. And then curriculum is still important, but it's not the only important thing. And we promise you some some action in that space. I think I just want to add to what Professor said, it's not just necessarily also looking at what and how we're going to do it. It's really important given South Africa's reality that we understand why we are doing it. Because that's a very, very big factor um, that we sometimes miss. We want to go into communities and we want to do stuff, but sometimes we don't always understand why we are doing what we are doing. I think also just to add to the gentleman at the back's question or statement, um, I think there's some problems with that statement, and this is a problem that we have in South Africa, is that certain types of language we use um, is problematic. To assume that the mother or the woman is the nurturer is problematic because we are ascribing certain gender roles and gender, and that these women or men are always just going to be either the leader or the protector and the provider versus the nurturer and the carer. And it's changed. It's definitely changed. So you see it in countries in Germany where the male is probably more nurturing than the female because the female is in the workplace while the male is looking after the child. So it's important for us to understand that these individuals can assume different roles. So you must be very careful of the type of language we use. We do not want to create a society segregated by women in the more softer sectors and men in the more harder sectors. Why can a female not be an engineer or a construction worker? And I think that's the type of questions we need to look at. Thank you very much. Another round of questions. There's a hand at the back. 
Uh, can somebody turn it down the fucking Yandex to make sure that we have a chance? Four questions. Good morning. Um, my name is Mosa. I'm a graduate of uh, the University of Zululand. During the times we're talking about, I was a student and I was a teacher by the, and the headmaster by 1989. I'm a graduate of the Rand Africans University out of choice because that was the first uh, white university to offer certain modules to students other than white students. And uh, my experience of higher education in South Africa was that uh, prior to the years 1985, most of them were compartment were put in compartments, and most of their functions. Uh, Zululand University was preparing black Zulu students to think in a particular way. And the German Westville was doing the same thing among the Indians, etc., etc. We've seen after 1990 uh, a great move by the universities in particular to change that perspective. And it started as mid-84, 85, when universities dropped uh, their previous policies of race. And then what we, see, what we saw happening up until recently is that universities have been in the forefront fighting against all forms of injustices of the past and of the present. <coughs> I haven't seen, and this is this where my question lies, entering the universities now are people who have heard about what was <coughs> happening in the past, who have read about it, who have never lived those experiences. And I think in my mind, the universities need to develop Indeed, what Professor Bonner was saying, a curriculum that addresses the needs of those people who haven't experienced the past. The dangers of the current situation is that it is teaching, well, it is, yes, it is teaching or developing a mindset that if you're white, you're numerical in minority, you're highly privileged, and for that reason, you need to feel ashamed of the past. If you're black, you need to be affirmed, you need to walk tall, because you fought for what happened in this country. And I'm telling you, if the majority of people of South Africa is black, why could they be put down by a few people? Answer is in my question. Having said that, my question was, are the universities in a way preparing themselves to focus on the people who didn't experience the wrath of apartheid, who are living now, and preparing them to think beyond that? Otherwise, to quote the Bible, they will be trapped in Canaan and still be thinking about Egypt. Thank you very much. Relevant question. Johan, can I invite you to join us as part of the panel? And then we'll take your questions. Hi, I'm Barry Kukula. I'm associated with the PRF. I'm a graduate of UCT and then spent 12, the last 12 years across the world, sort of in um, organizational leadership roles at the cold face in pretty chaotic and austere environments sometimes. Uh, my biggest what well, I'm most grateful for, for my, my formative years, like I call them at UCT, was teaching me to think liberally and critically, coming from the, the background. Right? So it links with what Professor Bortman said, and it also links with what Prof Schroeder said. I think that when we look at the topic, what's the university's role in developing leaders, especially in a country of South Africa, where a lot of what your, let's call them your mid-level leadership management, for want of a better analogy now, was purposely underdeveloped and is now also uh, lacking to pass that knowledge on to the next level of, of leaders coming through is to link critical and liberal thinking and questioning of everything to accessibility to experiential leadership uh, opportunities, we'll call it that, and it links with Prof. Schroeder said 
most of my leadership I guess that has been formed through my experiences post university, but that was subsequently formed through what Professor Portland alluded to about uh, changing the mind view from the everything's irreconcil irreconcilable to actually reconcilable. Think like the other. What makes the other think? What makes him want to do what he wants to do to me? Um, the, the current trend, certainly in the West today, is that people like Boko Haram, going back to what he said, is irreconcilable, and they probably, the leadership there, and the guys who can actually influence the chaps who kidnap girls and that are uh, just need to, at the end of a missile or drone strike, for you know, at the worst case scenario. Then leads into what the gentleman said here, yeah, uh, and Wade, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about this. He says, yes, okay, I agree, you can't put parameters, man must do this, woman must do this. But sometimes society isn't ready for change, and if you force change in society too quickly, then they get kicked back like, like what you see now in Nigeria. So a lot of, and, and also in the world, actually, northern Iraq, funnily enough. So a lot of these guys um, are formed through a leadership that says, yes, this, this change is being imposed on us. We don't like it. We're not ready for it, maybe, uh, at the majority. And it's then, how does the university, so Stellenbosch being a, a university too, but Stellenbosch being an African university, influence people like the Nigerian government, who see Boko Haram as irreconcilable, uh, influence the government of Somalia, who see Al-Shabaab as irreconcilable, influence the government of Kenya, who uh, try and blame Shabaab attacks on political uh, uh, opponents. How do we influence the mindset there to change that and say, right, actually, which we did in South Africa, we're still going through, and we're still having an experiential uh, development here. How can they learn from us? Look at this and say, instead of looking at these guys as irreconcilable, let's actually see what makes them tick where we can press the right buttons to change their mindset, which the university for me turns to critical thinking and get there to start to think like that. Thank you very much. We have a good there's one question at that table. Jan, I can a tweet or one third via that comment and can see it the end here. Maar wat is die idee ten opzichte van die huidige leiders en die herontwikkeling van hulle? Want het helpt nie ons soek mense wat ans in leiderskap al is het, wat nie die weg te dinne doen nie. En nou luid ons die ouders wat hulle moet een dag of hoof op hulle op, maar hulle gaan nie dinge die geleentheid kry om daar in te gaan en of hulle gaan besluit die leiders nie moet te werk om te probeer in public leadership in gaan echt aan die wist in die privaat sektor. So hoe breed jy mens die gap om die ouders wat ans daar is, so maai te verander? Dankie. Johan, kan ons by jou begin? Wait, Johan, if, if I can answer in English, the, the, the last question first perhaps. I think starting with, with current leaders, we have very good systems proposed by the Constitution, whether from Parliament, uh, systems of accountability, uh, Chapter 9 organisations, whether those systems are, are, are being uh, applied effectively, where the parliament is, is, is effective in, in effecting oversight, is, is, is hugely debatable. Um, I'm of the opinion that parliament is failing to a large extent in, in effecting accountability, especially in the executive, um, due to various reasons which I'll discuss outside of this meeting. Uh, but that's, that's the one question. Leaders will only be, current leaders will only be responsible and accountable if they are being held accountable uh, by the electorate meaning a, a re-look at our electoral system, a re-look at some of the constitutional provisions concerning how you lose membership of the National Assembly, making Parliament and our systems of accountability much more effective. A short answer to the three or two other questions, and, and a, a, a first question earlier on this morning pertaining to uh, young leaders or students at universities, and I think a question needs to be posed not only to the University of Stellenbosch, but all higher education institutions in South Africa. The one is, how do we instill a common goal in, in our students, uh, as proposed by the Constitution, a, a nation united in diversity, not being similar or the same, but united in diversity. And secondly, how do we instill a common set of values? And, and that's proposed by Section 1 of the Constitution as well. There's a clear set of values that, that's adopted and approved by our elected representatives. Accountability, responsiveness, openness, non-racialism, non-sexism, uh, human dignity, achievement of equality, it, it's all there. The question is, how do we make that set of values, not only constitutional values, but personal values? 
it's a common goal and a common, common set of values. And, and I think the question was raised earlier this morning, gentlemen from the medical, uh, medical school. Uh, how do we, apart from teaching people a profession, teach them to, to, to follow a, a common set of values? How do you internalize, personalize a set of values? And, and I think that's a question that I would like to pose to all of the vice chancellors of, of our universities in South Africa. How do you make a rounded leader not only being a good professional and, 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 and a, a carrier of knowledge, but somebody who, who can live personal values prescribed by our constitution. The question of reconciliation and nation building must be, must be at the forefront. No piece of legislation or policy or, or prescription will work unless we believe in that common goal. And that's based on reconciliation. It's based on nation building. It means we believe in the same goal based on the same values. And, and we shouldn't assume, it's a wrong assumption to take it that those constitutional values are necessarily personal values of every South African. That's where we need to start. And I think that's where universities should play a much bigger role than they do at the moment. It, it, the questions being asked of the kind of people that we put through a three or four, five or seven year course at university, uh, assuming that they may be the leaders, it may well come from other parts of society. But it should be what kind of uh, values they will be leading with internalizes personal values. I think um, I'm going to start with this idea and concept of uncomfortability and that will be the thread with which I'll answer the questions. And the question um, first is this uncomfortability with us holding ourselves accountable. And to answer the gentleman's question, the third gentleman's question is how current leadership, um, what the current leadership position is in my opinion is that we, if we consider ourselves leaders, have gone silent. <clears throat> so we see corruption, we see our peers not performing, but we never speak out. And that's fundamentally a problem. Because if you are working with another employee who is stealing money from some coffers or is not performing well, why have you become so uncomfortable to call them out on not doing their job? So it's really about us starting to realize that we are accountable not only to our company or to our institution, but to a broader society. And it makes you uncomfortable because I think once I start saying, you're not doing your job, it might mean that they are going to say, oh, but you haven't done this either. So I'd rather just avoid that conversation. But I think it's important for us to be more bold in holding people accountable to the decisions they make and to really ensure that we sometimes are those champions of showing people that this is the sort of leadership we want to see in the country. In terms of answering the second gentleman's question, I think change is sort of inevitable. We cannot simply accept that patriarchy is good because it's not good. We see it's not good. And I think it's not just the university's responsibility um, to be those voices that challenges Boko Haram and that of Iran. But I think it's also the country's responsibility to do it and every citizen's responsibility to do it. I think one of the situations where I saw and I was quite sad was when Uganda had passed the gay, the anti-gay bill, and South Africa went silent. South Africa had said, the government had said absolutely nothing. They had not condemned this idea that we cannot accept people who are different to us. So I think it's important for universities to become those catalysts that sort of propel and hold government accountable to say, wait a minute, we've done research, there's academic work that has been done on these various topics, why have you not condemned this gross human atrocity? And I think that's what universities need to do. They need to be the catalysts that really start challenging bigger organizations to start condemning stuff like Boko Haram. It's not acceptable for us to say that we are going to kidnap girls because they can't be educated, because they are threatening our men or we might be emasculated in our country. It's not acceptable and we need to be more firm in terms of condemning such gross atrocities. Okay, let me start with Dr. Shirzi. Uh, uh, there's an old Latin saying which is sine historiam jurisprudentem caecam esse, which means essentially without history, jurists are, jurists are blind. Now, we need that history, and that history relates to stories. And the stories of leadership of this country is extremely important. The stories of good leadership, the stories of bad leadership. I've recently written an article on Jackie Salebi, the case of South African public leadership that went completely bad. So we must discuss these stories, not only good leadership, but also bad leadership, and the stories of leadership. 
As an example, tonight I will be attending a session uh, organized by Alderman Marianne Hilo, who is present here, where we will have a, two sets of stories of community, the small community of Brackenfeld. The story uh, of leadership, which then combines these stories in, into building a new story. So we need the history, we need the current reality, we need to combine all of these things in creating sets of stories which will, which will inspire leadership. And that also means, and it relates to what I've already said, Universities cannot stay within the walls of universities. We are not in a country like South Africa. We cannot afford to be in an ivory tower. We must reach out. We must use the real life experiences, the stories of the people to learn from. And then after having learned that, build our action on the basis of that learning and relearn these lessons. And that's why we need this, this type of conversation continuously. We will expand on this conversation in the future and we want to engage with the community. Leadership is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's not in isolation. It's part of a societal set of systemic uh, aspects which need to, to bring about change. So we must engage, we must commit, and basically leadership, in my, in my summary, is about first of all having a purpose, and that purpose must be to make the world a better place in some way. Secondly, if you have that purpose, you link it to some form of groundedness, that means you know, must know your history. You must know your current reality. Thirdly, you must then be connected. You must connect to society. You must want to do things. You must be engaged. And then the fourth part is dedication and discipline. Leadership is not about only the head thinking or the heart feeling. It's about doing something and making society a better situation or getting society a better situation. And this campus and this university will take that that particular purpose seriously. Thank you very much to the panel. I'm going to uh, Erwin and Johan allow for three more questions and remarks. I know there's word two hands uh, on your table. Jan can also be um, begin. Yeah, Jan Lundau from an organization called Bidding for Life. Um, it's about sowing seeds in young people's minds about a better future, <coughs> not only for South Africa, but for the rest of the world. <coughs> the biggest challenge the world faces today is about the curriculum of the universities is the environmental issue. So we need to implement in our curriculum, in not only universities, but in all educational facilities, uh, an awareness, a part of the curriculum, an awareness of how we can live in a better future with respect for the environment. <coughs> it should be part of each uh, degree or each diploma or each high school diploma in South Africa. And when you leave an institution, you should have been part of an environmental project where you show respect. Talking about respect this morning, Zelda Lacrance, he spoke about a new book that will be launched on Thursday about a life with Mr. Mandela. Talking about leadership, in the last 20 years in South Africa, the only ray of hope about leadership came from a man called Mr. Nelson Mandela. So the institu your institution, Leslie, should really uh, also broaden your uh, leadership um, expectations about learning, teaching people what they, could, what they could learn from Mr. Mandela's style of leadership. And the last question, the interviewer, uh, the last question uh, was, what is the most what is the most important thing that you've learned? And she said, respect. Respect for yourself and for other people. It comes also to respect for the environment. We are really faced, South Africa is number one when it comes to coupled with a, with a mess, the carbon mess in Africa. So we are in a crisis. We as leaders should really start rethinking the way we teach our children and we teach our students and what we share amongst one another. I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Ma'am, do you still have a question? Okay. Goedemorgen allemaal, ik ben Johan Nieuwert en ik wil dit in Afrikaans zien, want het is ik zie dat het verkeerd is, ik heb alle geval gebruikt. Ik moet vies zeggen, ik zit vanochtend ook iemand skok en rarig met ontnuchteren. We zijn allemaal preek aanvaarden van verschillen, maar ik heb vanochtend rarig die illustratie van die tien van gestelde gezien. Dit is mijn keuze om ik een patriarchale stelsel wil aanvaarden. 
Dis my keuze om met een matriarchale selfie moet omvaar. Dis my keuze of ek een demokraat wil wees of nie. En ek denk dis waar ons moet begin. Alles wat ek veroogend gehoor het, het ek gaan om die universiteit met dit doen. Die universiteit is het hoe ek doen wat geld vraag. Die universiteit is docente en studente. En docente ontwikkel nie studente nie. Studente ontwikkel hulle self as mense. Ek denk ons begin verkeerd. Een universiteitse taal is om primaire navorsing te doen. Om vir my nieuwe theorie op die tafel te sit. Nie bedenke. Dis die ene taal om leiders te ontwikkel nie. Ons wil die winsie sê. Die leiders word die die gemeenskap ontwikkel. En jy aanvaar self daar verantwoordelikheid, meneer die jeugleier. Die statiete is vir jou daar, maar as jy dit kies om nie te registreer nie, om nie te gaan stem nie, hou jou mond oor corruptie, wat jy veroorzaak het. Ek is baie ergens na gesiteerde vir ook en sê, nie voordat ons as Zuid-Afrikaners in die wat jy heel ons verantwoordelijkheid gaan nakom nie, vergeet van enige ander theorie. Dis die enigste maatstap is jou deelname aan die voorrecht om hierdie land in die toekomst te vat. Baie dank. Baie dankie. Matthew, jy het een vraag gehad? Dit is Eric. Good morning, uh, my name is Abigail. I work with the Lesson of Learning Program at Stellenbosch. I'm a graduate of Rose and Stellenbosch. I'm, I'm a Delhi Rose scholar. Um, my question is quite complicated, so I'm just going to explain it a little bit. Um, I often get a question coming from student leaders. Okay, so what is our struggle? Um, you guys fought against quite a bit, and that was very really kind of clear cut, right and wrong, and you were fighting against. Um, so, as far as I'm concerned, the main struggle, the main issue that we have in South Africa is inequality and uneven development, and it's a very real question of our context, particularly in Stellenbosch, given the very, very, very visible and, um, I think, inexcusable level of inequality that we have in our own town. Um, so, the question is, what is the role of universities in developing leadership for me within that context? And I read an article a while ago about a student at Rhodes, a rural student who attended Rhodes, and wrote the article in cooperation with the lecture. An article was about how this um, rural student was perceived by other students who came from more affluent backgrounds, both black and white students, who would almost refuse to acknowledge and would treat as invisible the student, because the student did not subscribe to their affluent um, lifestyle, way of dressing, way of speaking English, smartphone, and all of that stuff. So it seems like once students get into a university environment, they perceive themselves as being part of an elite, maybe even being part of the thought leaders as part of an affluent and growing middle class. And even if you aren't there yet, you should still subscribe to that and participate in that kind of culture, which involves a kind of um, disapproval and um, fear of and unwillingness to engage with people who are poor, who are from the lower class. And so I. Um, I think that as students come into the university environment, they become blind to our most important question, which is inequality, and it's because it threatens their own existing or perceived to be in the future privilege. Um, so for me, that's a very important question: is how do we develop student leaders who have the same levels of um, seeing themselves as part of and in solidarity with the major struggle of our time? Um, and I think that we're not meeting that need, which is why the EFF gained so much traction among particularly young people who are not in university or unemployed people of all ages. Um, so where is the solidarity, engagement, and struggle with the other when the other is a poor person? Um, and how do we create graduates who are not going to want to bash the system and, and take a very high radical material line on inequality, but who are going to work constructively and in cooperation with poor people to create an economically different future? So considering that we're in partnership with the School of Public Leadership, the Business School, the University, that is going to be a really important question. So, Thank you. Two contrasting questions. So can I give you an opportunity? 
And here are your after that, and you get the honor to see me. You still have a very short question, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Tim Dunn. I'm with EFASA as the chairman of the trustees, and I'm a former professor at the University of Cape Town. I'm wanting to interpolate something that's not at odds with what is being said. It may be unsaid just in this particular environment or this particular occasion. One of the problems we have our no uh, with our notion of leadership is that it is geared towards the elite. But actually, leadership is to be exercised everywhere. In all contexts and in all situations. And one of the first developmental confrontations that an adult has to recognize is that moments of leadership are pregnant in their daily life. And every one of them, particularly our students, need to be encouraged to take that on. And that takes courage. Simply to differ in opinion with somebody responsibly takes courage. But it is truly important. In fact, all the unimportant things we would say are important because every one of them is pregnant with a moment from which we or somebody else can learn. And I'm victoring ourselves on that is an important skill. One type of leadership involves technical mastery of the material with which we engage the world, particularly professionally. And in that particular type of leadership, we don't want people to make mistakes. But in the delicate issues of our relationships and our philosophies and our engagements with the human community, we all make mistakes. And what we have to have is the right attitude to failure. The right attitude to failure is to recognize it when it happens. And there is a wrong attitude to failure, and that's letting it continue. So we don't have to be right, but we have to have the humility and the wisdom to recognize when our current projects are failing to meet the realities of the people in front of us. And since we are citizens and addressing the terrible conditions under which most of the people in this country have to live in this cold weather, with minimal amount of food, with minimal access to the power that lights the home and um, makes the stove. In those things, um, we need to affirm that everybody can make a difference, but it's just very hard to do so. Thank you. I think it is a wonderful answer for the two previous questions, uh, but I'm sure we'll make one or two remarks on that as well. Can I give time to Enki Fulton if there's one person at the back that would still like to ask a short question? Hi, Jeremy Bates. I want to keep very brief. I'm, I'm so encouraged by this conversation. It's so necessary. Um, something that does worry me a little bit, though, is when I listen to, especially the voices coming from the university side, I hear a lot of teach, teach, teach. We need to teach, we need to make, we need to shape, we need to form, we need to tell. And, um, you know, if I ask the question um, to myself, really, where does the answer lie to many of these types of questions that we now? What is a leader? What do we want them to do? I'm quite certain that the answers don't lie in this building or in this university, but I'm very certain the answers lie out there with millions of wonderful young people um, and the people that you then want to teach. <coughs> so the question, um, and Prof. Aaron, one or two of the things that you said really encouraged me, but the question that I have to you guys, if we're asking the question, what is the role of the university, um, is our role um, at the university to try and teach these fellows to be leaders, that's difficult. Right? You can teach a boy to build a kite, but how do you teach somebody to be a leader? Is our role um, to try and tell them how to be a leader, or is our role to be a facilitator and to facilitate them to come up with the answers, to facilitate, let them find their purpose, as you said, let them then define what, it, what they see as a leader, and if they, if then give them the opportunities to create, as opposed to teaching, teaching, teaching. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, Must end it there. I'm really sorry, but I'm sure we'll stay behind and, and have the opportunity to ask one or two more questions. Leadership in its in its active form and in its shall I say intellectual form and in its emotional form is about engagement. So it's engaging people in a sense of of life <coughs> life situations. So the, the idea of teaching leadership is in itself problematic. It is about, um, and it also relates to Marianne's point, it is about engaging people in, in processes by means of which they discover and discuss, discuss and discover approaches to, to problems. And in our teaching, probably the wrong word, in our facilitation of leadership development, we try to build that into the system. For example, the leadership in Dala, for example, being engaged in societal projects. And it leads to the point that you made. We want to be engaged with projects in society, use that as the basis for experiential and action learning to teach or to learn about leadership jointly, rather than from a teacher tells approach. However, we must also be realistic. There is just limited capacity in terms of capacity and commitment for these types of things. So we all, those of us who are engaged, have our own limitations, but we also have limited people who are engaging. So we're not going to get to perfection, but striving towards perfection might lead us into getting somewhere closer to, to a form of engagement and, and, and some form of change. And if we can make a difference to some people, that's probably the best we can do because we're not going to make a difference to all people. And this sounds as if we're making a difference, but meaning that we engage people in terms of helping ourselves and as a joint, as a collective, to make a difference to the world. Maybe I should stop there. I, I sort of agree, well, I agree with most of what Professor said about the engagement aspect of leadership, and I think. Um, I'll just also end off with a few thoughts and answer some of the questions. I think Abby raised a really valid point. There's this idea that 20 years into democracy, there's still large-scale inequality in this country. Whether you want to believe it or not, that's the case. You see it in Rwanda, you see it in Kailiche, you see it along the end too. It's still a large-scale problem in this country. And it's important for us to understand our role as active citizens in taking part in the process we, we hear of this idea of a rainbow nation, and I think that idea is slowly fading away. We need to shift towards a new approach of us starting to share stories. And part of that sharing of stories means that you are going to have to confront your power and privilege in a democratic state. And I think to answer the lady's question, it's not about imposing the sort of idea that patriarchy is wrong or matriarchy is wrong. It's this idea of actually sitting with someone at the table that disagrees with you, and whether you leave there, when you leave there, you may go thinking that actually my way of thinking is completely wrong, and you adopt a new way of thinking. But it requires of you to be very honest with yourselves. And some of us in this country have not yet come to the place where we are honest with ourselves in terms of our power. We are not honest with ourselves in terms of our responsibility, and that's really lacking. But I think essentially what needs to happen is that we need to start shifting to talking to each other and engaging with communities so that we can really understand the intricacies of the South African reality because it's much, much more complex. We cannot simply simplify it. I also want to just say that we don't need the sort of, this idea of the Mandela myth means that people need to live up to the so-called Mandela standard. And Mandela is great. But I think what we need to do is to start having young people and everyone in South Africa realize that you have the potential to be great. That I don't want to be the next Mandela of the country. By all means, no. That would be an absolute shame. I want to be the next Wade or the next Tabu or the next Kate or the next Jan that can change and propel this country to great heights. And once we understand that potential within us, we will start to understand how we engage with society and how we take the country forward. Thank you. I think to, to 
that's one of the ways just said, and it ties into two of the questions. We need to be able to get young people to think about why the way, to think about why they think the way they think. And, and we need to teach them to think in such a manner within a particular value framework, the framework I've mentioned earlier on, provided by Section 1 of the Constitution, a common value framework. Universities and institutions of higher education can probably not teach somebody to be a leader, but they can teach them skills that can equip them to be leaders. They can teach them skills within the value framework that can guide them to be leaders. What they make with that, of course, will be for their own making. But the, the, the ability for universities to create an environment in, in which a thought process develops based on a common set of values cannot be overestimated. I think it's a matter of, of a democratic environment in, in, in which we function, a constitutional democracy. Individual responsibility is crucial. That's one aspect that, that not only the youth in our country, but I think a, a number of adults miss completely. The fact that you have an individual responsibility to make participatory democracy work. You cannot just vote and wait for five years and then go and vote again. In between, you have a duty, you have a responsibility to participate, and participate within the set of value framework. Uh, I disagree with, with the notion that universities do not have a role to play. They may not be teaching individuals to become leaders, but they do have a responsibility in a position of authority that they find themselves to create an environment where people start to think about how they want to lead others and how they want to lead themselves. And again, that, that's based on, on, on a value framework in, in which they can create an environment that's conducive to a human rights culture, that's conducive to our Bill of Rights, and in which people can, can develop towards a common purpose. They do have a responsibility in creating such an environment, even though it may not be effectively teaching those values. But creating an environment in which students can learn and engage in a manner of mutual respect is certainly a duty that, that no higher education institution can, can disagree with. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much to the panel. Well, this conversation on the theme of um, universities and leadership leaves us with a lot of questions and, and um, thoughts that we should continue with. The ideas of patriarchy and its impact on society, the ideas around universities playing a role in whatever way you are in society and specifically in developing and gearing leaders. Um, the ideas of, of equipping and the ideas of growing, the ideas of thinking about the issues in society, the role models, what we do with our stories and the variety of histories in the country. I think it is pivotal for us not only within universities to continue this conversation, I think it is of immense value that in all our spheres, also in the roles that we do play in society, uh, we keep on thinking. Uh, guiding uh, conversations, being involved in conversations, and hopefully creating a future uh, that belongs uh, to our nation, a better future, and a society uh, that, as Wade said, can and will be more equal. By and it was great to be here. Uh, we share a partner, a School of Public Leadership and the Francel Slavic Institute in the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and I look forward to furthering, furthering this conversation and engaging with you, Erwin, and, and Johan around our partnership. Thank you very much. Dames en heren, net kortelijk van mijn kant af van die um, Centrum voor Grondwettelijke Rechten. Uh, baie dankie vir die teerwoordigheid volg ek, dat ek dat die moeite bedoel het om by ons aan te sluit. Uh, in, in particular appreciation for our speakers in the absence uh, Professor Botma, I'd like to leave. Uh, Leslie, guiding this, this conversation and, and facilitating it in a very, uh, very effective manner, way for yourself. Uh, and, and everyone, as partner, that we see and look forward to continuing with this breakfast seminar next two to follow, hopefully, within the next two or three months. Uh, in particular, appreciation for the comment on our station, and please convey our appreciation to, to the colleagues. Uh, these kind of conversations is extremely important for, uh, for, for furthering debate. Uh, for furthering ideas. And then we'll have two more of these breakfast sessions towards August and, and September, um, moving into similar kind of issues of leadership, similar kind of issues of leadership within a constitutional framework. So that is the, uh, the, the important angle that the Center of Constitutional Rights would like to bring across. That when we think of leadership, when we think of public leadership in particular, we have to think of that as part and parcel of the constitutional framework. 
framework in terms of which we have to govern, in terms of which we have to live, in terms of which we have to engage with mutual respect. Uh, we cannot detach the, the thoughts from, from each other. Uh, these kind of discussions should invigorate discussion, should invigorate ideas. It is, it is not preaching to the converted, it's creating an environment in which we can raise particular issues, how thorny or that may be. Thank you very much for our appreciation. Looking forward to seeing you again at uh, Drive Safety. Thank you. Thank you. You can have some coffee and have some more conversation. We should locate, however, the loop by about quarter to ten because there are other functions following. Thank you. Thank you.